Hello, creative people. Welcome to Creative Conversations. My name is Hollis Citron, and we are so happy that you have chosen to spend your time with us. I am owner and founder of I Am Creative and Express Yourself Publishing, and I am on a mission to expand the definition of creativity beyond a pencil and a paintbrush and to empower people, especially adults, to own their voices and talents that come in so many different forms. This space was created to talk to people with all different kinds of jobs, hobbies, and interests, and to have conversations about experiences and perspectives all centered around three questions. How do you define creativity? How do you incorporate it into your life? And why do you think it's important? Then we have a free-flowing conversation and we see where it goes. So I have had the opportunity to speak to so many. I've spoken to musicians, comedians, doctor, lawyer, wrestlers, Reiki masters, and entrepreneurs as young as 13. And these conversations explore the reality that creativity is not cute, it is necessary. People have defined creativity as that magic spark, how we show up in our life, imagination, basically all that we are and want to be, do, or have. So I believe from my heart that sharing these stories gives one the ability to expand their thinking, open themselves up for more self-expression, to feel more empowered, connected, and dare I say, happy. So my inspiring guest for today is Leslie Zemanek. She is a brand analyst, hand analyst, and story guide, helping extraordinary entrepreneurs own their wow, find their voice, craft their stories, so they can be seen as the star that they are. Leslie, welcome to the space. Hi. Hello. Can you hear me? I can. Hello. Hello. How are you? I'm good. I'm really looking forward to our conversation. Okay. So, Leslie, before we dive in... Could you tell us just a little bit more about yourself and whatever you want that to be? Oh my gosh. <laughs> That's such I an know. open-ended question. <laughs> it's so open-ended. We're going to dive in more, but just maybe give us like a little clip. Okay. Well, um, I like to tell people that I've been making art since I was old enough to hold a pencil. And uh, I think creativity has been the driving force of everything I've done. And I'm kind of the queen of remaking myself. So I just find something new to do that falls under that uh, umbrella of creativity. Mm, This is going to be such a fun conversation. Okay, so Leslie, we're going to do a would you rather question first, and then we'll dive into the first official official question. So are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. Leslie, would you rather have a pet zebra or dragon? Oh, dragon. <laughs> no question. <laughs> I was like, Hollis, what are you, stupid? A dragon. <laughs> well, I'd never say that, but. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Said, said with love. It's okay. <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah. It was, it was obvious to me. It had to be dragon. <laughs> so tell me, tell me, because there was such, there was such force in that answer. Oh my goodness. Well, I, um, well, to me, the dragon is such a powerful image. And like when I drive, I, I really hate people who tailgate. So I always visualize a dragon <laughs> who sends a breath of fire out the back of my car so that they will get off my tail. <laughs> do you seriously? <laughs> I do all the time. <laughs> I have to tell you, it cracks me up every time. And I understand that intuition that I am connected because these are literally like intuitive hits of the ones that I should pick. And as soon as I was scanning, I saw this and I was like, that's the question to ask. (laughs) That's so funny. (laughs) (laughs) Oh my God, I love it. And that's such a great image. It's like a fire coming out the back of, out of the tailpipe or just like, get off my ass. (laughs) Right, exactly. And, and you know what? It works most of the time. Does it? <laughs> yes, it does. Oh my God. So funny. Okay, everybody. So a good little, you're not hurting anybody. This is causing nobody harm, but it's a really good visualization to put out there. <laughs> <laughs> right. We're already getting good tips. So, okay. So first official, official question is, how do you define creativity? 
Well, I, um, I, I, I have two ways I define it. The first is that it's bringing something that only you can do or say or be or do a certain way to the table of where you are at any moment. Mm -hmm. So it's about the uniqueness of who you are. I believe we're all born creative. We all have something to bring that adds to the world, it, you mm -hmm. know, makes it something new at every, at any moment. Yeah. Um, the other way I define it is, is that it's um, practice plus play equals something you produce. Mm. I like that word play. So explain, so practice plus, plus play equals the, whatever comes from that. Right. Something pr produced. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, you know, really creativity is play. It's experimentation. It's, it's, it has to be play. It has to be some play in it because if you get too much in your head, I think it becomes less creative and more uh, forced. There mm -hmm. has to be an element of, well, let's try it. We've never tried it that way before. Mm -hmm. And the thinking of it as play keeps it light so that if it doesn't work, it's no big deal. Yes. Yes, it's true. Cause that's, that's exactly, that kind of sums everything up. It's when you're in that headspace, then it, it, it blocks the end, the headspace in the sense where you're fixating or perseverating there's the headspace that's the creative, the creative, the problem solving and the creating where the, the wheels are turning and you're getting excited and you feel all that, the, those feels that you feel in your body, right. like everything gets all jittery and your stomach is like all butterfly -y and you're like, oh my God, I'm so excited. This is, or there's the in your head where it's like, why is that happening? Why is that happening? Why is that happening? Right. Why is that happening? Why is that happening? <laughs> right. Or the inner critic or the perfectionist takes over. Yes. And they're not nice. Well, not if you're trying to be creative. Yes. <laughs> they are the enemy. <laughs> or even in it, like that perfectionist. I remember this is just, I don't know if it has to do, but it's just all of a sudden popping into me. The story of one time when in college in art school, I was taking, this was, I was getting my master's in art education and we were taking our courses, our art courses. And um, I got my undergrad in ceramics, but it was paper mate, um, book binding. And I was like, that'd be fun to do. And the woman was sitting up there like so prim and proper and folding everything perfectly. And I just watched her in awe. And I was kind of like a bull in a china closet. <laughs> I just, that perfection thing was not there. Being an eighth of an inch off, I was like a quarter of an inch off. <laughs> so in the crit, she kind of said to me, this isn't necessarily for everybody. Oh, no. <laughs> Oh no. So I made a clay book with clay tablets that fit into a wooden box. And that was my book. <laughs> oh, it sounds really cool. I would love to see that. I'm like, okay, I don't have your to an eighth of an inch, but I will do it my way. That's well, that's what it comes down to in the end. Right. Right. So take us a little bit on your journey. You have, I can't wait until we talk about fingerprints and all of this, Okay, <laughs> but, but I want to hear, cause your journey really is a, um, it's a good one. So wherever you want to start in it, uh, please share. Um, well, boy, um, do you want to go the fingerprints in there right away? I don't know. I think we can build up to it because you've worked in so many different mediums and, um, I mean, you've been a chef, you've been a, um, you've been a painter, you've done so many different things. And like you said, you've been doing it since you could hold a pencil. Yeah. And, and to me, the visual was, it was where I, my place, my, it was my happy place. And I started out as a painter. I, I, I would sew. Um, when I went to go to college, my dad didn't want me to go to fine art school. He was determined that I would not be able to make a living. So I ended up studying fashion design and mm. I worked in that industry in New York for a while. And that was just such an intense, 
place. So that's when I went to culinary school because I had been taking all these business trips for my job and fell in love with food. So that was kind of the, I think that was the biggest detour off the traditional art path that I took. Mm -hmm. And then I hurt myself carrying heavy stuff in the kitchen and went back to school to become a graphic designer right around the time when everything was going digital. And that was exciting because it was like the wild west. Mm -hmm. Everything was new and nobody knew where it was going. And it was really just a few pioneers stepping into it. And I did that for a while. And then in 2001, I think it was, the internet bubble burst and all the jobs went away. Mm -hmm. And so I had this other skill that I had learned, which was learning to read fingerprints, to analyze fingerprints. And I had been doing it kind of on the side for a long, long time. And since there were just no jobs to be had, I said, well, what have I got to lose? And I hung out my shingle to do that full time. Mm -hmm. And um, honestly, I haven't looked back in a way. I've been doing that for decades. But most recently, I've gone back to my love of working in, in it, well, when I worked in graphic design, I worked for small marketing firms. Um, so I went back to that love and I also became allergic to paint somewhere along the way. So I couldn't huh. do my painting anymore. Mm -hmm. And that's when I started doing live storytelling on stage. So I've taken the three great loves that um, marketing for business the fingerprint analysis and the storytelling. And I mushed them together, as I like to say. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I created something new out of, out of three parts and created Brand Fingerprint Lab. Whew. So before we even do a deeper dive into this, I want to acknowledge, because I thought it was kind of funny that you said you were in the fashion design world and that was intense. And then you went to become a chef. I mean, those are those are both pretty intense spaces. It's not like you're leaving one. I guess they're intense in different ways. Um, but the kitchen, and especially the time when you went into it, women were not like, yes, come into the kitchen. Oh, that's true. It, I actually went on a lot of job interviews where they would say, we don't hire women. And of course, you know, that was not something they could legally do. But I, I faced that quite a bit. But honestly, for the most part, I found most of the people who worked in food to be really down to earth and um, wanting to help bring other people up. Okay. Mm -hmm. Most of them. So I, it, a lot of those places felt like family. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I could see that. I could see. I mean, I haven't worked personally as a chef, but being a waitress and a bus person and a, um, you know, a hostess working in a lot of different restaurants that way. It's very fast paced. So people can get very like short, very fast, but, oh, at yeah. the end, but at the end of the day, it's like sit and have a drink, have some food. Right. Yeah. The intensity there came from, I, I used to compare it to being on stage, right? The curtain goes up, the show must go on no yeah. matter what happens, no matter what goes wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So all that you said, and first I want to welcome the people here live. Thank you so much for being here. We appreciate you. Any questions or comments, please feel free to put them in the chat box below where we can see them. You can be part of the conversation. So, okay. So all of this and then graphic design, and like you explained, then you took your three loves of the brand analyst, the hand analyst, and the storytelling. So tell us more about Tell us more about, since you created this space, tell us more what it is, please. <laughs> okay. So um, basically, I, I love helping people figure out who they are and how to be the best version of themselves. And with more and more people going into business for themselves, and, you know, I think over the last couple of years, that's really increased as people have kind of decided that with the world the way it was, maybe I shouldn't wait uh, until later to follow my dream. So 
I love helping people get to the best parts of themselves. I love helping them reframe that part that keeps them from stepping out all the way. And I love the storytelling. So I, uh, and basically just to get into the left brain for a minute, the statistics show that when you tell a story, you're more likely to make a connection than if you just list a bunch of um, mm. data or, or, um, you know, the, um, the advantages of your product or your service. So, you know, that it, I'm putting those three together just seems like a natural fit because when I help people show up, it's so that they can really share who they are at their most basic, um, level and like they can make friends with the people who they want to do business with and share their stories. And it, it felt like such a great way to put those things together. So I like to say it's first it's map, which is what's in the fingerprints. Then it's mindset, which is getting yourself to your sweet spot, to that space where you feel confident. And then the last one is message. Mm. So going to this, first of all, this concept of the fingerprints and explain, cause I just think it's so interesting. It's this whole thing, you know, people are, they love this idea of a palm reader and somebody tell me what's going to happen to me. And do I have a long lifeline and all of this kind of stuff, but this concept that the fingerprint, that there's no other fingerprint that is the same. Right. So the person who I learned this system from is the gentleman who came up with the whole concept and he came up with it by actually studying medical studies and psychological studies around the ridge patterns in the fingers uh which and and the palms and they did a lot of studies about what you know genetics that are involved with it and it's kind of really geeky and I don't want to get a whole lot into it, but essentially, mm -hmm. uh, even identical twins don't have the same fingerprints and they're formed fully formed by 16 weeks after conception, which is even before gender is determined. Mm. So, and the brain is developing at the same time as the fingerprints. So essentially there's more nerve endings from your brain down into your hands and through your fingers than any other part of your body. And there've even been studies that show we get more information through our hands than we do from our eyes and ears combined. Hmm. So, you know, like I said, it's very geeky. I consider myself a, a one of the geeks in this realm, <laughs> <laughs> which I think you have to, to really get deeply into this, but it's, um, you know, the whole idea that we all have something unique to bring, it's really just echoed when you think that every single person has different fingerprints. Nobody has the exact same one. Yeah. Nobody has the same set. Like I said, not even identical twins. Well, yeah. I mean, it's like literal is that you have something unique to bring. Since right. We are all one of a kind, literally. Right. And they never change. So I like to t say that what your fingerprints show is your origin story. What did you bring in with you to share? What are you good at? What are you learning? How do you best relate? How do you best serve? Those hmm. are the things I look for when I'm looking at people's fingerprints. So your and, fingerprint, and, I'm sorry to interrupt. No, go ahead. Your fingerprint never changes? No, I, I, the only way you well, okay. So you've heard stories of people trying to burn their fingerprints off with acid. When the skin heals, it comes back. Mm -hmm. I have seen people who've like cut themselves badly enough to make a scar, but the mm -hmm. basic fingerprint pattern is there. It just looks maybe a little interrupted by the scar tissue. Okay. Uh -huh. uh, and I have actually seen people who've cut off like a portion of the top phalange of their finger yeah. and the fingerprint has grown back over the top, folding over the top. <gasps> Uh, the first time I saw that, it blew my mind. Oh, my God. It blew my mind. That's freaking amazing. Yeah, I know. It wants to be there. So wait a minute. So, so with this being said, is, 
And ladies and gentlemen, if you have questions in the audience, please ask, because I know I have a ton of questions. <laughs> <laughs> so is this, I don't know, is this bringing in stuff? So at we are born, is this bringing in stuff if you believe in past lives that this is, is this our journey? Is this, is it in our fingerprint to show what our journey is, our strengths, our weaknesses? Uh, yes, actually. And I, when I work with people, I do sometimes say, if you believe in past lives, you could say that this is something you've learned over many lifetimes and you don't have to learn it again because you're, you're already good at it. And, and then I'll say, talk about the thing they're learning as something that just wasn't in their purview over those lifetimes. But at the same time, I'll also tell people, you don't have to believe in past lives for this to be true. Mm -hmm. And then it just, I just talk about it in terms of how the brain is wired. There being nature versus nurture and the fingerprints are the nature part. Mm. And that's a whole art in itself, right? Is reading people and understanding how to speak to them and which angle to come at them at. Yes. Yes. And I've done this long enough <laughs> that I'm pretty good at it, actually. Uh, <laughs> I, I've been, I've gotten that feedback from others as well. Mm -hmm. So talk to us more and tell us about, so when you're working with um, an entrepreneur or someone and walking them through these stages of the brand um, analysis, the hand analysis and the story guide, where do you, where do you start? Oh, I always start with the fingerprints because that's the map. Mm -hmm. That's the map. And basically everything we want to do after that, we're going to refer back to the map because it's, it's like being on the hero's journey. If you have the map, you can find the treasure. Mm -hmm. So you, you want to highlight those things that you're, you're excel at, that you're great at, that you bring to the table that somebody else doesn't that the zone of genius, the thing that you can do with your eyes closed yeah. that you don't really need to, to work at. It's, it's, you know, instead of trying to do everything for everybody, just really say, look, if you work with me, this is what you're going to get. I can do this for you. And most people are pretty confident about that. But what's interesting to me too, is a lot of times when I talk to people about their zone of genius, it comes so naturally to them that they, I have heard from many, many of my clients, well, isn't everybody like that? Yes. <laughs> because it's so easy to them. They don't think it's, it's a skill. Yeah. yeah. They don't give it credit. So yeah. I have to remind them, no, not everybody is like that. And yeah. then when I work with uh, reframing the pieces that they're not so good at, basically um, I use something we call the Goldilocks rule, which is, finding that it's about finding the sweet spot, right? The just right, because everything mm -hmm. in, a, in a lot of philosophical um, systems, they talk about everything containing its opposite. So if you're feeling like you're not that confident, the opposite side of that is, is being overly confident. And somewhere in the middle of that is the sweet spot. Mm. So I work with people to find their sweet spot. And we then add that to the original zone of genius to kind of create the, the um, what, what my teacher would call the exalted zone of genius, the, the next level up. Mm -hmm. And that then is even better about saying, this is what I bring to the table. And then everybody has, there's, there's, um, everybody has this one area in which they best serve. And it's, it, corresponds perfectly with Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Everybody has certain needs. We have needs for, um, for, you know, being, having our, our security met. We have needs for belonging. We have needs for problem solving and, and making sure we have good skills. We have needs for then becoming independent and growing. And those are four needs that they talk about in motivational theory. And there's four fingerprint types. So everybody's got w at least one of these. And some people have two that they're the best at. And the way they really earn their chops there is by working on that piece for themselves. 
And mm -hmm. so you, talk, you hear people talk about marketing and they say, always tell people the problem you're going to solve for them. Well, the problem you're going to sell, you're really good at solving is the one you solve for yourself. Mm. Because you, you, I mean, you have more at stake if you have to solve it for yourself. Right. So right. sometimes people aren't really sure what that is, but the fingerprints know. But the fingerprints know. So can you give just one example as if when you're, if you're looking at someone's fingerprint, which you could do, you don't have to be in person, correct? You can do right. this through. I do it long distance all the time. I send people some fingerprinting um, sheets and they send them back to me usually digitally and we go from there. So what is maybe one thing that you might be able to tell from somebody's zone of genius or be able to tell from looking at somebody's fingerprint? Well, um, oh gosh, that's, that's a big question too. There's so many things <laughs> I, because really the, the possibilities for people's zone of genius is, is almost infinite. It, it's not like there's, I mean, we have 10 fingers. It's not like there's just 10 because people have combinations. But um, why don't I just share a story? I had a um, client who was dealing, and one of the things, the problem she was needing to deal with for herself was feeling overwhelmed all the time. Mm -hmm. And it was, uh, she and her, her spouse shared a, a career path, and yet she was the one also taking care of the household. And she was a writer. They were both writers. And eventually... Uh, she was always feeling like there was just too much, too much, and it never felt like she could rest. And I finally said to her, write about it. And she ended up writing a bestseller. Wow. New York, New York Times bestseller. We're not just talking Amazon bestseller. We're talking New York Times bestseller. Mm -hmm. um, and then left writing to become a, a someone who works with think tanks, helping to get funding for programs so that families with two working parents aren't in overwhelm. Wow. So I, I love telling that story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, what's beautiful about this whole combination of what you're doing is people like you're saying, when you're looking at something and there's bullet points, well, this will do this for you. And then you do this, this, and this. It's like your brain is like, ah, but people, we've been telling stories since the beginning of time. Right. That's how right. people connect. Right. Ursula Le Guin, the, the science fiction writer, uh, I may misquote it, but one of her quotes was, there have been civilizations that did not use the wheel, but there has never been a civilization that did not tell stories. Right. Yes. Yeah. No, it goes w way back. And our brains are wired for them. Mm -hmm. And what's even more interesting to me is that when someone tells a really compelling story and you're the listener, it is actually possible for your brain to get rewired as you're listening. Ooh. So the, the connection that happens from listening to that story doesn't end when the storyteller stops talking. Right. Right. Well, that's the beauty of these things, right? Is you could be listening to a friend telling a story or be in a scenario where you saw a performance or whatever it is. And it could have happened 20 years ago, but it's, it, it it could have affected you so much that it made you pivot and change careers or whatever. Or you could still be thinking of that story 25 years later. Well, right. That's what our best memories are. They're stories. They are stories. Every bit. And so often it's those stories that are kind of like the, the, the bloopers, the blooper versions. <laughs> <laughs> that those is true. The, <laughs> the best stories. <laughs> right. <laughs> Right. The things that didn't work out. <laughs> yes. Yes. Well, all the good stories have stakes, right? They have something goes wrong mm -hmm. and then you have to figure it out. Yeah. And, and it's, if you were watching a movie or reading a book, it's, that's when you start to root for the main characters when things start going wrong. Yes. 
my husband who's in um, TV and film, he's an editor and producer. And one thing he told me, which I didn't really realize until he actually said something, was that the the good guy and the bad guy are the same person. They're just on the opposite end. Oh, that's interesting. That goes along with my other theory about everything containing its opposite. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're just the contrast of each other. Right. That's interesting to think about. I'm like, yes. He has made... <laughs> it's so interesting to hear from his perspective, but sometimes with the whole editing piece, we're just screwed up watching movies because now we can see it. We're like, I see the edit. I see the edit. Damn. It's like our 19 year old. It's like, dad, I can't just watch a movie. But if it's done well, then you know, then you're not aware of the edit. <laughs> oh, interesting. That is but, interesting. Yep. But yep. Um, what you grow up with. Um, right. Well, that was like me when I would go out to eat when I used to work as a chef. <laughs> oh my God. I'm sure. <laughs> Tell us a chef story. Oh, gosh, that was so long ago. <laughs> I'm sure you have one. Okay, so, well, I do have, a, I have many, but um, <laughs> I used to be famous for wearing really, really big earrings when I was in the, the fashion business. So when I went to culinary school and started working there, I did not stop wearing big earrings. And I had a pair that looked like swords. Uh -oh. And oftentimes my fellow chefs would put little shish kebabs on my earrings. They would thread <laughs> like pieces of onion and cherry tomatoes. And, and I would walk around the kitchen with my little shish kebabs on my ears. <laughs> I love it. I thought it was going to be something gross, like something happened and the earring fell out and <laughs> no. your earlobe like ripped off or I, I didn't know where that was going, but it was a, <laughs> but it was a funny story. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay. So before we go into the second question, this is a really dumb question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. So we have 10 different fingerprints. Yes. Well, 10 different fingers. Yes. So with that being a different fingerprint for each, when you're looking at a finger, are you looking at all of your fingerprints, all of your 10 fingers? Yes. It's like an algorithm. There's a um, system where you, the fingerprints are ranked. There's four basic types of fingerprints. Mm. And of course, everyone is slightly different because nature doesn't draw the same way on every human or, or every finger. And the system is such that you look to see which fingerprints are on which finger and how many there are. Mm -hmm. And there's a, a basic, it's basically an algorithm for then reading what, what that means. Okay. If that makes sense. So interesting. It takes a little practice. Before I was allowed to go out and when I was studying, before I was allowed to go out and charge money for doing this, I had to read a hundred pairs of hands mm -hmm. and bring back proof that the person I read for would have to sign a sheet. Well, that's wonderful because it shows, you know, that you're invested in it. You know what you're talking about. You're not some bullshit person out there saying, I can read your fingerprint and making up a whole bunch of hooey. Right, well, and also it's like I said earlier about my definition of creativity, it's play plus practice. That's the practice piece. Yeah. It's like learning to play the piano. Yeah, yeah. So, how do you, you told us some things, but nowadays, how do you incorporate more creativity into your own life? Oh, well, I, if I had a million lifetimes and have a million careers, I would probably do all the different creative things. Mm -hmm. And so one of the ways I do, I make time for creativity in my own life is I'm constantly redesigning my garden and uh, reworking my space in my home. So I do a lot of creative work there in my, in my space. Mm -hmm. So you're moving things. So like interior design ish kind of things you mean? Like you're yeah, kind of just, yeah, well, you moving. know, moving. Yes. 
um, deciding that I want a different light fixture or changing a color somewhere or um, right now more of it is outside. Uh, mm -hmm. I the house I'm in now when I bought it had no landscaping whatsoever. It was just bark chips. So it was a blank canvas for me. Mm -hmm. And that's just been really wonderful. But I, yeah, I do it on the interior too. And, you know, I, having been a painter, I have way too many pieces of art to hang and not enough walls to hang them on. Yes. So there's always op opportunities to change something out there. Yeah. So for the gardening aspect, is that something that you were familiar with before? Or did you just get excited about the fact that, oh, I have a blank canvas and let's let me learn? Um, I've had other homes where I've transformed the landscape. So mm. it's been something I've been doing. Um, I, I tend to not stay in the same home a lot. Sadly, I move all the time. <laughs> I, I move mm. and leave my canvas for someone else to complete. Mm -hmm. That's pretty cool, though. Yeah. 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 It's Hopefully not being they... so attached that you can't move. Right. Hopefully they do complete it. Or, but you know, or they make it their own in their own, whatever way they intend to. Yeah. So, okay. So we have the gardening, we have the inside interior stuff. What else? Is there anything else that you do for you that nourishes you? Oh yeah. I, um, I still cook a lot and I, um, I, for a while there, I took up jewelry making uh, metal smithing. So occasionally I'll still do something with that. And when I was, you know, the way I got into fashion design is that I started sewing when I was old enough to sit in front of my mother's machine. So believe it or not, I still occasionally make some of my clothes. Mm, that's great. So did your mom teach you how to sew? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> that was a very quick answer too. Oh, no. <laughs> she hated all that domestic stuff. She couldn't cook either. <laughs> so did you teach yourself how to sew? Um, I think my grandmother may have shown me some, although she was more of a crocheter. But yeah, I did teach myself to sew a lot. And I definitely taught myself to cook. Wow. Uh, my mom had all these cookbooks she'd gotten as wedding presents, but they were all stored in the attic and I went up and got <laughs> them out and started making messes in the kitchen. <laughs> and how did they feel about, were they like, oh, Leslie's in the kitchen again? <laughs> or what was their reaction to uh, your I curiosity? Don't know. I think they were pretty happy to eat what I made. <laughs> That's good. That's good. Because otherwise it would have been stifled. Well, Yeah. Um, I think they just weren't happy that I, I wasn't as good at cleaning up after myself. <laughs> and that is still true today. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. I just had this conversation with my husband and 22 year old. I said, this is how I need your help. When you take something out and when you're done with it, can you please just wipe down the table and put stuff away? Just please. Like I, I, I know there's certain things I'm going to be cleaning up and I'm fine with that, but you're both old enough. Well, you know what? I think creativity is messy. It is it's messy. messy. It it's is. meant to be messy. <laughs> it is. And I don't have a problem with most of it. <laughs> There's just certain things. But yes, I agree. It is a messy process, which kind of I just want to reinforce too, is that everybody, we make mistakes. It's like right. screw up. Just yep. mess, mess up. Yes. It's, it's, it's the only way we learn. It's the only way you can know what you like and what you don't like is by making mistakes. Right. I actually had this conversation with my last client. Hmm. I had very much that conversation. Yeah, it's a basic thing, but all of us being, or so many times, us being perfectionists and the inner critic and what are people going to think and blah, 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 blah. Yeah, we can get annoyed about things, but we're we're going to mess up. And what I've learned to do is just really laugh. I have a TV show also, and I literally went blank for what felt like five minutes. I don't know how long it really was because I have not watched the episode because they do not edit. Oh, no. <laughs> and, and I was like, I'm not watching it. Um, 
but I was with my guest and I was like, help me out here. And (laughs) (laughs) anyway, I just learned to laugh about it. And at the end I was like, guys, this is shot live. So, um, human moments. Here we go. <laughs> I actually love when people make mistakes and when the let those things happen. I mean, think about when you're watching like the Olympics and the ice skater falls, right? Mm-hmm. And then when they get up, the audience always cheers. They do. Always. They do. And it's like when my when my son ran track for a minute and the person who comes in last, I think it's the biggest cheer. <laughs> Yeah, because everybody is cheering them over the finish line, like right. Because <laughs> you don't, people in human nature, we don't want to see people fail, so we're like, come on, come on, you can do it, you can do it. Yes, I think people they they love it when you are human. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So tell us about these. Tell us what a story slam is. Okay, so story slams, they're, I mean, you may have heard of poetry slams. People just get up um, in front of the mic and uh, tell a story. And the ones that I do, I mean, there are certain guidelines. Uh, I, I do a couple different ones here in, in my hometown, but one that I do is that's pretty famous and is known worldwide is The Moth. Mm-hmm. And essentially, they give you a theme for the night. And you go in and you put your name in a in a hat. And if you get called up, you go up on stage. And for that particular slam, you have to tell a true story. It has to be about you. And you're limited to five minutes. So wait a minute. Do you know the theme before you get there? Yes. Okay. They okay. publish the themes actually pretty far ahead so that you can okay. decide if you want to go in and put your name in the hat. Okay. And then there's another one that I do that actually you're, it's not so much a slam. It's more of a, a, I guess it's not really a slam because you know, you're going to be on stage, but there's, this is another event that I love doing because it's called um, pants on fire. So Mm -hmm. seven storytellers go up, six tell a true story that's wild and over the top. And one tells one that's a lie. And the audience has to guess which one is the lie. (laughs) I love it. It's really fun. Oh my gosh. And, and I, I am happy to report that I told the true story that fooled the audience. I got voted the liar. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> that is so fun. So is there a time limit on those also? Yeah, they're supposed to be five to seven minutes. Okay. Do you want to tell us what your story was in a little bit, like at a brief view or no the one that where i convinced them i was the liar yes okay so this was a true story about a business trip i took eons ago in europe before they had built the tunnel under the english channel and so before they built the tunnel you would cross the english channel on a train that they would drive onto a barge Oh my God. And I happened to be on the very last voyage that this train and barge were taking. They were retiring it. (laughs) And I was working for a guy who was just crazy. And he really loved creating chaos. So he, we ended up at the wrong train station first, and then he left his passport at that train station as we were scrambling to get to the other train on time. So when we got to the the train, they were having a celebration because this was its last official voyage. Meanwhile, this was a beautiful train. It was made by the same folks who built the uh, Orient Express. Okay. It's, it was old and gorgeous and they were popping champagne and the people who were running the train were drunk out of their faces. (laughs) (laughs) And my boss, because I was the only girl on this trip, decided I should try to bribe the conductor to get us into the other country. (laughs) Oh my God. (laughs) So it was a pretty wild adventure. Um, And at one point, uh, we were all in the same sleeping compartment and the conductor had his ear to the door. And when I opened the door, he fell in the room. <laughs> so it sounds pretty over the top, which it was. 
and kind of unbelievable. So everybody thought I must have been making that up, but it is totally true. <laughs> it is totally true. Oh my God. Isn't life interesting? Yeah, that was definitely <laughs> an unusual adventure that probably not a lot of other people have ever had. <laughs> I was thinking, no. <laughs> oh my gosh. So before I ask you the next question, before you get up on stage to tell one of these stories, how are you feeling? Um, well, when I first started doing them, I was always pretty nervous, but I've gotten a lot better at it. Uh, you, I mean, you never know if you're going to go up and you never know what order you're going to go up in when you go to the slams and you might go up after somebody who just told a brilliant story and you think, well, I'll never top that. Right. So it's different every time. But I've gotten to the point now where I don't feel as nervous. I just do the best I can. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I usually practice ahead of time by telling my story to my dogs because I know they won't <laughs> criticize me. <laughs> I just think it's such a great example to be doing something out of your comfort zone and putting yourself in a space, even if you are a storyteller, but there's... I've heard of people doing this when it really scared the hell out of them because it was just pushing them to a whole new space. And especially when you don't know the order, it's kind of like, you know, the teacher might call on me, but the teacher is, you know, the teacher might call on me and your stomach is kind of like, uh, and you're either looking down and acting like you're <laughs> reading <laughs> or looking straight ahead. You know, it's, 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 anxiety provoking but exciting right and i have gotten up on stage and told some very vulnerable things about myself so mm -hmm. um but those really do get a an amazing response from the audience again it's connection right and if people seeing you see you up on a stage like there's a difference i think between and tell me what you think. It's it's like between a comedian and a storyteller. I don't like going to see a comedy act because I empathize so much. I'm like, oh my God, if they're not funny, I'm going to be so embarrassed. <laughs> like I don't, I, it, it's kind of like I feel nervous for them. Right. Whereas a storyteller, they're sharing a part of them where there's there's nothing that you would have to laugh at. <laughs> Well, it, particularly with the, the moth story slams where the stories have to be true and about the storyteller, that's definitely true. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I've never seen anybody get a really bad reaction to their story in those, mm. in those events. Mm -hmm. hmm. Well, do you have any kind of a morning routine? Um, I wish I did. <laughs> 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 um, I try. <laughs> so that's, well, you know what? It's interesting because I've been incorporating this question in and it's just interesting to hear. And some people have this tried and true mo like morning routine. Some people wake up at four in the morning. They have a two hour, you know, I meditate. I do this. I do that. I do this. Um, some people are like, I don't, I, I just kind of get up and I just breathe and say, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And set an intention for the day and move on. Um, some people, one person said, I wake up and I put on music. I grab something to drink. I let the dogs out and it's her meditation to watch the dogs play in the backyard. Yeah. My dogs mostly determine what my mornings look like. <laughs> <laughs> they are the determiner of the morning. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, I, particularly right now, because I have one who's kind of elderly, so he yeah. needs a lot more of my help. Yeah. Yeah. No, I get it. Is there anything that you do mindfulness wise at all for yourself? Yes. Uh, several times during the day, I go outside and I find a caterpillar or a spider or a bird sometimes is, and I have hummingbirds who live in my yard year round mm -hmm. and I talk to them and my neighbors uh, out loud mm -hmm. <laughs> and my neighbors think I'm absolutely <laughs> whacked. <laughs> I've, I've had some of them ask me about it. 
<laughs> <laughs> and and how do they phrase the question? <laughs> the, well, they go, you know, I, I I hear you talking over the fence, and I was just wondering. <laughs> You're like, and mind your own business. No, I'm just like, <laughs> I know, I know. I, I honestly, I, you know, I mean, I know some of them. I feel like they're talking back to me. What can I say? <laughs> I the it. crows, in particular, they seem to talk back. Well, you know what? They actually have. They're very intelligent. They are something to like the. Um, I think they have, uh, like. I remember my husband saying something and I'm going to totally be wrong about it, but either the vocabulary of a five-year-old like in their, in their language or um, some kind of brain capacity of a five-year-old, like they're intelligent birds. Right. It doesn't surprise me because I have, uh, my dogs are standard poodles and they have a 3000 word vocabulary Mm -hmm. and the average human has an 8,000 word vocabulary. So, Mm -hmm. so I, I talk to them too, but they are too smart at this point. Mm. do animals have finger do they have paw prints no there are a couple of critters that do have ridge patterns on their paws mm-hmm. um certain monkeys do okay and i think possibly co- i could be wrong i think po- somebody's gonna write in and say no you're wrong <laughs> I, I think koalas maybe mm. mm-hmm um, I know I do have one image of a of strange monkey's paw on my mm-hmm. computer with these beautiful ridge patterns. Oh my God, gorgeous! Mm-hmm. But um, I d- have not looked to see if they say anything. <laughs> I love this. Now instead of calling it fingerprints, I'm going to call them ridge patterns. <laughs> well, they are. That's what they are. They actually <laughs> call them. Um, they, I mean, in the medical, they call them skin ridges and uh, there's some other mm. terminologies they use for it. So cool. But they are. They're a lot like like the sand, the waves in the sand. Mm-hmm. You, you know, you see those kinds of patterns everywhere when you start looking around in nature. You do. You do. We're all connected to it. Wow. Okay. So we're wrapping it up. We're getting to the top of the hour, which this has gone fast. Um, the third and final question kind of wraps it up and puts a nice little bow on it, which is why do you think creativity is important? Oh my gosh. I, I have a very strong opinion about this. <laughs> okay. Um, as much as we need a certain amount of status quo to keep the world running, I believe it's creativity that moves us into the future Mm. we need both we need the status quo to keep the world humming but we need creative thinkers and creative doers to create to to make a new future so that there's always something that we're moving towards Hmm. something better something bigger something different yeah. some invention, some new of, way of treating each other. Yes. Because let's face it, we're certainly not perfect the way we are. We've never been. And ladies, no. and, and ladies and gentlemen, this is not just about creating a painting or creating, you know, a visual art. This is about within your realm, within your expertise, within your passion, of creating and doing and something that will help humanity in whatever way that it will help humanity. Right. With a vision or in, an inspiration for other people. There's so many ways. It isn't just about the arts. And even in the words that you use, yes. even in how you treat, most importantly, how you treat people with your words. Yes. Words are, it. words are huge. I have so many times, like I just had a vision of uh, one point, you know, when you're in the city, any city and there's, you know, sadly a homeless person standing in the middle with a sign. And, and, um, I was coming back from work and I just rolled down my window. I said, I honestly, I, I don't have anything. I wish I had something to give you. And he said, you just gave me a smile. 
So thank Aww. you. He said thank you for the beautiful smile. Right. And, and so it, you change something that way. So something as simple as that, and I know that could sound, you know, hippie, gooey, ooey, whatever. <laughs> but but some of my students, they said to me one time, they're like, Miss Citron, you're a hippie. I'm like, well, how do you define a hippie? They said, someone who just wants to do good for other people all the time. I'm like, okay, I'll take that. <laughs> oh, that's an interesting definition. <laughs> that's, I'll appreciate that. I appreciate that. <laughs> that's cute. Uh, so, Leslie, thank you so much for hanging out and chatting with us for this hour. Oh, it's been a blast. It's been a lot of fun. So much it made fun. me think. <laughs> Well, good. Well, good. So before we get to the point of you sharing how people can connect with you, do you have any final words of anything that you feel like you want to share and that you maybe missed? Um, what do I want to say? That I just think it's important, even in the smallest way, that you just be willing to show up as you. Hmm. I, I don't try to be, well, okay, here's what I'll share. I, my, one of the things my teacher, who I learned the fingerprint system from, used to say is that it's important to be the star of your own movie and not a bit player in someone else's. Yes. Yes. So just being who you are, bring it to the table. And your fingerprints tell it all. That's right. <laughs> this is why everybody, you need to reach out to Leslie because Leslie, tell them how they can connect with you. You can find me at um, brandfingerprintlab.com. And I also have another website at bravelyalive.com. Mm. Is the Bravely Alive, is that about, is that more about like um, stories or branding or? Well, the Brand Fingerprint Lab is more about stories and branding, and the Bravely Alive is more just strictly about fingerprints. Okay. Um, that was a, a phrase that came to me in some healing work I did uh, when I was reclaiming myself after my divorce. Mm -hmm. And I liked the phrase because, to me, that's what happens when people really claim their zone of genius and mm -hmm. commit to being who they came here to be is they yeah. become bravely alive. I think that is the most perfect way to end this podcast. Again, Leslie, thank you so, so much for being here. Learned so much from you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. This has been a blast. So glad. And everybody, those joining us live, those catching the replay, we so appreciate you. We know you could be doing anything with your hour, and we so appreciate you hanging out with us. This space is all about inspiring each other, connecting, and sharing stories. I believe we've always needed this, but I think we need it now more than ever, more than ever. So please like, follow, share, listen on every space that you listen to podcasts on, give us a review, and let's spread this message far and wide. We really appreciate you and wish you a good morning, a good afternoon, a good evening, wherever you're listening in the world and look forward to connecting soon. Goodbye, everybody. Bye. Feeling inspired? Let's just get rid of this, throw away this whole perfectionism thing, this whole concept that we have to know how to do everything. You know what? You don't. <laughs> Let's just do things and try things and realize what we like and what we don't like it's all part of the process the self-awareness feels so good you feel more connection to yourself connection to others and huh be a happier more joyful person just imagine that so you are where you are in the process so you can dip your toe in the water to try new things at a slower pace or you can dive right in here at I Am Creative and Express Yourself Publishing, we meet you where you are. So there are so many ways to check us out. Explore our experiential kits. They have everything in them that you need to try new things. You don't have to buy anything else but this kit and just explore. There's Creative Shui, which is seven elements to join happiness. Through the Publishing House, Express Yourself Publishing, multi-author books, coffee books, solo book opportunities. It is all about expression, all about it. 
And it's again, just trying these things and realizing what you're good at. Don't all of a sudden think that you only fit into one box because we don't, we are not made for boxes. <laughs> there is also my TV show, I Am Creative. Check it out. The links are all in the body of this podcast. You can just click the link. And you know what? Don't say, oh, maybe I'll check it out tomorrow. Life's too short. Just click it. See what it's about. There is honestly no judgment. It's all about exploring the possibilities, expressing yourself, and expanding your thinking. I will give you the website, which is IamCreativePhilly.com. So I am creative Philly, P H I L L Y dot com. And just remember that you are an expressive being, so own it. I am looking forward to hearing your story because we all have one.